My name is Rainer Janke. My name is Rainer Janke. I've worked here for Spät for more than 31 years. I was basically born an organ builder because my father also has an organ building business. I'm the senior organ voicer. I'm responsible for every instrument that leaves our premises. You need a workplace with good lighting. I've set mine up myself. Our desks are quite high so that we don't have to sit with hunched backs. Our desks mostly have a covering such as carpeting to prevent the pipes from getting scratched. We always have a voicing chest that you can put the pipes on and shelves where we keep the pipes. We store the bigger pipes in an upright position and the smaller ones lying down. That's standard practice. We're going to copy a Baroque pipe and a Romantic pipe. I've chosen two very well-known organ builders and instruments. One is my favorite instrument. It's the 1709 Baroque organ built by Andreas Silbermann. It's in very good condition. There have only been minor changes to the pipes. I've looked at it and listened to it several times to get my ear in. We'll take that one for the Baroque organ. The second instrument was built by Walke in 1869. Ebert Walke is the most significant German organ builder of the Romantic period. I think this instrument is fully preserved in its original state. We have two very different kinds of pipes. The Silbermann organ is of the flute type, while the Walke organ is of the principal type, with a strong principal sound delivered by the four-foot octave. We're in Marmoutier, which is west of Strasbourg, very near Saverne. We're at an old abbey church. In my view, this is the best preserved Silbermann organ out there. Hello, pleased to see you here. We've spoken on the phone a lot. It's great that you're giving me the opportunity to take a look at this organ and examine a Silbermann pipe more closely. If you move over to the right, could you show me where the stops are and where's the mantra? It's here. On the first manual. Let's give it a go. The second manual, of course. Sehr schön, sehr 
very nice, very soft. It has a very warm quality. It sings very nicely. Where's the Preston? That's here. I wanted to see if I find anything there. D, that's inward. A bit dull, a bit fast. The G sounds nice, very soft. A bit soft, but very nice. Here's the F. It has a very soft entry, very nice. That would be the note that I'd like to have. <laughs> long leg and a short one. That'll stay in place. Can you show me how to get in? On the right-hand side. Oh, there's a lock up there. What kind of lock is it? Just a regular one. And now I slide it. Great, that looks great. Can you go down and play that note? That's lovely, thanks. Keep it pressed down again. Let's start. Length. Four, two, seven. Seven. Four, two, seven. That's not my best handwriting, but it's enough. Length of the foot, exactly 200. Diameter. That's tough because organ pipes are never perfectly round. I'd say 38. Bin hier so bei 38. So, maybe 36. 37 on average. But I have to subtract the thickness of the material. Let's see if I can measure this properly. It's not overly thin. 0.8. Now I'll measure the size of the mouth. I'll measure in the middle first. 8.5 8 8 exactly so between 8 and 8.5 millimeters now I should photograph it That's good. I've measured everything. I want to remember the sound so that I can recall it at home. I want to listen to the G again. Hmm. 
It's very soft. It sounds very round and very intense. It has a lot of body. There's this warm streak. I like this. I associate it with mantra. That's more like a German principle. Nice and warm, nothing metallic. That's why people often say old organs have this warm, soft sound. Why don't new ones have that? That's really typical here. It has this slight ta-ta, but it's very gentle. I have to make a note of that. It's taken for granted in the organ scene that you can't copy pipes and organs. You can't copy the pipes, some say, because the material has played itself in. The alloys are different. They knew different techniques we don't have today. In my view, all that's incorrect. The material is irrelevant unless it's really much too thin. I know all the voicing techniques that were used and I use them too. If there were a difference, we'd find out about it. I think that's going to be the exciting thing about our project. I don't know yet what the outcome will be. Let's try and copy it. I'll try and incorporate all my knowledge and then we'll see if we come to a different result. The pipes have arrived. Let's take a look. There's the first one. It's nicely packaged in wood shavings. Let's open it. and check whether it's the way I wanted. We've got the lead feet I ordered. It's nicely engraved. We discussed that on the phone. The angle of the lower lip is just right. The placement of the upper lip is correct. This is high purity tin. It looks very good. The first thing I have to do is cut open the pipe. I have to mark the size of the mouth. Let me check what I wrote down. Eight to eight and a half. Eight at the edge and eight and a half in the middle. I don't have to be exact just yet. A couple of marks. So, jetzt haben wir's. I have to make a cut. I have a knife. I'll use a little bit of oil so the blade glides better. I'm going to scratch the surface first, a little below the mark I just made. I have to make sure my line is as straight as possible. I use this wooden support to avoid cutting into the side of the pipe. Dieses Brett, in das ich reinhacke. So, I made a good cut here. Now I have to cut the side. Einschneiden. I have to be very careful so I don't cut into the upper lip. I have to score the line several times. I have to try and lever this out. I'm not quite through. Now I can lift it out. But I need extra support for my eyes.
I'm going to tidy up the edges and get them right. There's too much material left. So, here too. This pipe looks a bit spoiled because I slipped and scratched the pipe. That's not the best piece of craftsmanship. I'm checking to see if I've made the mouth the right size. It's eight millimeters on the outside. That's right. And eight and a half is the measurement for the middle. That means I have to take off a tiny bit more. Now that curves a bit better too. Many claim this curve has an impact on the sound. It will too, but not a massive one. The effect is quite small. The curved opening is always something people have an opinion about. The next thing I have to look at is the flue. I have to clean it up. There's always some chalk residue that I have to brush off, otherwise the chalk would get into the flue and impact the sound. I'm going to clean it carefully with a toothbrush. I agree with the pipe maker that he should adjust the feet with a plane, not with a machine, so there's no ridge on the left-hand side. I'm going to check whether that's all okay. I'm going to run along it here. That looks very good, just what a baroque pipe should look like. I'm going to run over it again to make it nice and smooth, so that there's no ridge. Then I have to adjust the upper lip, so that it has the correct position, and so that it's straight. It's a bit curved at the moment. The original pipe had a dead straight upper lip, maybe even a bit inward. I'm going to apply some pressure to it with my piece of wood. Good. I can run over this edge a little. It seems to me the upper lip is a little too thick. That looks good. I think the size of the mouth is good. It's a nice, full, round note, but it's quite scratchy too. It's quite hard. There are just too many other noises going on, along with the main sound. Now I need to make the cuts into the languid. Let me check how many there were on my photo. That's three, six, nine, twelve and a half. Now I'm going to make the nicks. I'm going to make them only in the languid by using this tool and pushing it into the languid. It's very soft, it's made of lead. That means I need a lot less pressure than I would with a regular languid. Now 
That's better now. The scratchiness and the hardness have calmed down. But it's still a bit turbulent. The sound still isn't quite clean. But it's better. The three cuts make quite a bit of difference. They've removed the worst of it. The sound is much cleaner now. The stationary sound is lovely, warm and soft, with only a small amount of scratching. The start is still a bit hard, and the note has also become faster. These cuts always make a note faster. It goes into the octave more easily. This would be a good result for a pipe that's tuned in the normal way. It's a bit too late. It could go into the octave a bit faster. These cuts are differently spaced, doesn't matter. The only factor is the overall width. I've made most of them now. They're probably not deep enough yet. Let me blow into the pipe. The sound has become a lot softer and very warm. It's not yet as fast as the original note, but the language is still a little high. I have to knock it down a bit, here at the corners, so that it comes down to the same extent everywhere. I always push it back again a little. I go too far and then push it back. That's very nice already. I can see in my photo that there are some nicks in the lower lip too. They remove the spitting sound a bit. I'll make some in the lower lip, just like on the photo. I'll make another one here, just in the lower lip. Okay. It's become softer in its start again. Not by a lot, just a little bit. It has this nice warm round sound. But with enough of an edge. It's good now. I'll have to see about the rest in the church. I'll have to see whether I want to make these cuts any deeper and whether I want the mouth to be a bit wider or narrower. The start should probably be a bit faster, but it's already looking very good. So let's try it in the church. Mr. Zigris, can you play the F? Compare it with the G. Okay, good. I have to close the foot a little bit. The pipe is getting too much wind. Could I have the F again? Still too fast. That wasn't enough. That's what I thought. The bottom of the foot was very cylindrical. It's not just about the diameter. Let's give it a go. Let's have the F. Compare it with G. We're still a bit low. I've left the pipe too long. I'll blow the G. And now I'll blow my copied note. Yeah. 
Ja, der ist noch It's ein more scratchy. Maybe the flue is too wide. And now it's too quick again. Can we hear the F again? And the G? And the F? It's still a bit fast for me. It's almost too quiet. What bothers me most at the moment is the difference in pitch. I have to shorten the pipe a bit. A G, F. and now the F, G, F, what do you think of the difference? The F is a bit more muted. Muted. I'll go over the cuts in the language. Listen now. Jetzt. It's still a bit more muted. I thought it would become too metallic. Again. Now it's the other way around. It's just a small change in the width of the flue. That immediately changes the timbre. I'm going to change it back again a little. F again, please. G. Almost identical. We'll wait till everything's gone cold, but I'm very satisfied with the result. It sounds very well. On tenter hooks. This is the original. I can't tell the difference anymore when I move my head around. If I leave my head in one place, then I still perceive a difference. But when I move, which I always do when I'm listening to the sound, because there are always areas of pressure where it sounds fuller, but a few centimeters to the side, the sound is leaner. It's fuller here. And that's exactly what I'm experiencing here. But they're like identical twins. The start is so soft. It has the same character as these pipes, like this one. Very nice. I wouldn't have thought it would work out so exactly. I'm pleased. <laughs> if someone wants to tune an instrument and you realize they have a talent for it, then you take them under your wing right away. And then, of course, your company has to be okay with you training someone else. Then you proceed in the teacher-student relationship. That takes many years. They say it takes around 10 years before you can tune an instrument independently.
We're in Waldkirch, in the Catholic Church of St. Margareten. This is a typical church for this area, with a high altar and the tabernacle in front of it, and the two Marian altars and the pulpit in the middle of the room. It's very typical for this area. This Valka organ is a very typical romantic organ from 1869. It's a purely mechanical action wind chest, nothing pneumatic yet. That's why this is the really nice classic romantic period. The good thing about this organ is that most of the pipes have remained unaltered since they were installed in this organ. I have to play it. I want to get used to the sound and the organ so that I remember what this four foot sounds like in its total context. I can tell right away that this forefoot is very striking, like a vial. It brightens the sound. But we also have four eight-foot principal violas and the whole flute. They're very powerful. That's why we need a very vigorous octave forefoot. The octave number four is right behind me. It's not in the main body of the organ. That's why you have to be a bit careful, and I like to lean back a bit. You can hear that it gives the whole eight-foot stock a big outline. This four-foot is necessary so that these eight-foot notes don't become dull. There needs to be a brightening. The four-foot has a different job here from what it did in Marmoutier. In Marmoutier, it was just about the increase, mantra, prestant, to reach the next level. Here, when you have four, at least four, if you've joined them up, then even more, you have a brightening. That's why the forefoot has to be more powerful here. I can show you the typical setting, principle eight foot. It sounds almost neo-baroque, a bit tense. I'll play without the forefoot. You can see right away, it's much brighter. That's the same as using the mantra and prestant stops in Marmoutier. That's not how the octave is intended here. You can even add the gem horn and the borden if you want. And then... It needs this level to get a brightening into the sound. That's the last one on the outside. That's the first one inside. Then I need the second one inside. That's the F sharp. I can't take the F, which is a bit nicer. I have to take the F sharp because I need the place of the E so I can put the comparison pipe there later. It's a bit squashed and labored, but it's okay. It sounds a bit pneumatic. That's the one. We'll have that one. Let's go in.
Yes. There we go. The whole pipe is just as it was made. Nothing's been changed. You can see that this foothole is very old. It has the same marks as the outside skin. Nothing's new about that. It's as oxidized as everything else. Compared to Marmoutier, I have to measure a few more parameters. I have to measure the expression. Four, zero, five. And the opening. This is crucial. I've got the speaking length. I need to know how wide this area is, because that's crucial to the sound. I call this area the ring. The wider it is, the more horn-like the pipe sounds. The narrower it is, the more regular the sound. Here we have the pipes that have been copied from the Valka organ. As you can see, the face of the pipe is quite different. The lips are different. They're very rounded. They've been marked. They've not just been pressed as they were with the Silberman. That's why we have sharp edges. There's no difference anymore between the foot and the speaking length. It's the same material. I'm going to draw the mouth. It's a bit bigger. We're not at 8 to 8.5 anymore. We're at 8.7. It's not that different, but it is a bit wider. I'm going to mark it first. In this area, and this one too, there. Here we have the special feature that we have beards at the side of the mouth. Aus dem Aufschnitt Rest, der hier drin bleibt, werden gleichzeitig Bärte geformt. Das heißt, I have to cut a bit lower, so I have something left to cut afterwards. Damit ich noch was zum Nachschneiden habe. So. Aufpassen, dass ich nicht. I have to make sure I don't cut into the edge. That's good. A bit more. It's the same process as for the Baroque pipe. Nothing's changed. But here's the difference. It's going to get difficult now. This isn't routine anymore. I have to cut twice here and leave a small beard. The problem is not to go in too deep. It's better to go in one more time than to slip with too much pressure. Maybe I'll leave out the rest, and then I won't need to apply so much pressure. I'm through. That's one side. Now the same on the other side. I'm through. Now I can lever out the rest. I'm getting used to this now. I have to get this out. And that's how I create the ears at the side that I can open up. I can make them look a bit nicer. Trim them with the shears. Abschneiden. 
Und ich gesehen, I saw on the photos that they have their corners broken too. Gebrochen. Here again. So. I'm going to take my pliers. I have to make sure they don't break off. They're marked from the inside. You can see very nicely here how deep that marking is. Right. Now I'm going to measure it again because I only measured the preliminary markings before. I'm going to make a mark all the way across. And since it's straight, I can use my brooch. I won't need my knife anymore. You can make cleaner cuts with a brooch. More precise ones, too. Let's check the measurement. I think I've got the measurement exactly right. Yes. Now I'm going to clean it up. Next, I'll take care of the upper lip to see if it's straight. It looks fine. It's a bit too far in on the left. I'll push it out too far and then push it back in. I'll use my thumb. That's the upper lip. Now I can chamfer it a bit because the upper lip we're after is a bit thinner. It's a bit chamfered. I can do that with the triangular scraper for the cleanest result. This corresponds roughly to what I can see on the photo. Now I'll clean the flue again. The flue is a bit wider here than in the Silbermann pipes. I'm going to check whether the pipe maker planed this without creating a ridge. Looks good. I can't feel anything. It's smooth. I'm going to run over it with this small piece of wood. So, jetzt bin ich soweit. I'm ready to make the nicks in the languid. We have, this one's in the shadow, 11 of them. I don't know how to do that. Let's try. That's a similar number to the Zilberman pipe. One, two, three... Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Maybe they're not deep enough yet, but they could be good. They look good. I'm going to blow it to check. Still a bit slow. I can push the upper lip out a bit. We had the problem on the left. There's a little bit of give. I'll push it out and a tiny bit back again. The languid is very high. I'll knock it down. And a small counter movement. I even think the big foot will fit. It can take a little bit more. That's fine. But now I have to see to the speaking length. Four hundred and six. Six.
with a width of 12.3. I need the saw. Now I have to mark out the tuning slot. I'll try it freehand. We normally use an angular rail for this, but I'm going to go freehand. It's too much bother for me the other way. I can do it nicely like this. And now I cut across. Now I can go in here with my finger and push it out. Now I can roll this up. I always start at the corner and then the rest follows automatically. Automatisch nach. Und dann kann ich so, so I can just roll it up. Aufwickeln. Und damit so ein and to make it look aussieht, better, I'm going to redo the cut up here. Dann du von dem so it's not so rough and ugly like the saw cut I made earlier. So, let's wipe this off. Now we have the two pipes on the table. You can see the external differences with the mouth edges, the tuning slots and the like. Let's blow them to see. I prefer to do that rather than put them on the voicing chest because this one's 87 millimeters and I think this one's 67. Let me check. 69. They have different pressures. That's why they're hard to compare on the chest, because it's hard for me to change the pressure. I'll blow and you'll hear the typical sound. I'll start with the romantic pipe. And now the Baroque pipe. It's still a bit too low by a semitone. I've also left it a bit too long still, so that I can cut it just right later, because this one's cut to produce the right note, whereas this one can be tuned using the tuning slot. That's why I've left this one too long, but you can hear it already sounds very nice. I'll blow it again. It has a relaxed, soft start and a soft but energetic note. It's much louder. The pipe is further back in the organ complex. It fulfills a completely different function. That's why these two pipes are so different. But they're both very typical. Baroque doesn't mean sharp and romantic doesn't mean dark. There are romantic organs with vile principles and really wiry sounds. The typical aspect of a Baroque pipe is that it sounds relaxed and free. The start is soft, but there's a precisely defined point. We need that for polyphony, because we need to hear when a note begins so that we can hear the exact line that's being developed. I need a soft start for the romantic pipe. Let's listen. 
Das so fop, 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 fop. Das wird nachher, das Fauchen wird nachher. The hissing will be drowned out later when it's in situ. All you'll hear is that it's soft. At some point the note is there. That's necessary for these homophone lines. These notes have to transition into each other. They have to merge and blend. Not ta 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 machen, also diese Stückelung. That's why it's a soft start. I've noted down that it has a bit of a hiss. In this one is very clearly defined. Very relaxed. Let's see what it sounds like. This is the original. This the copy. It sounds a bit brighter. It varies depending where I move my head. I'm just surprised that it's almost identical. If I close my eyes and I don't know what key I'm depressing, I couldn't tell you which one's the original and which one's the copy. Fascinatingly similar. These ones sound different. They're the neighboring notes. They're a bit more matte. That's a G. It's very bold and clear. This one's a bit darker. They're from the front. The F sharp and G sharp are the same. They work very well together. They're in the same organ stop family. They have the same expression. You'd never know it's a new pipe. Let's see whether this works. Let's take it out and put this one in there. It fits perfectly. Then I'll put the other pipe back. It belongs here. I'll put this one over here. And let's play with this configuration. Voicing means coordinating all the stops with each other to achieve the right balances. Voicing isn't just about being able to copy a note. It's your foundation. It's what you have to be able to do. Art starts when you start playing with your craft.
Ich erkläre kurz die wichtigsten in Turnierwerkzeugen. I'll give you a quick rundown of the most important voicing tools, such as this Mabel Spatula. It has almost no growth rings, so it has the right balance of softness, so the edges of the flue aren't damaged, and a certain hardness to make the flue wider. I have this spatula, which is very thin. It tapers nicely, so I can file down the languid. And then I have this square end, so you can clean up the flue a little. The next tool is for lifting the lip. The important aspect here is that it has this rounded shape. It needs to be convex in this direction to avoid creating corners and edges in the upper lip when you raise it. You're meant to work with this surface. You can run along it and make it round out. The next tool is the one I use to make the nicks in the languid. I always make sure it's sharp on both sides, like a sword. These nicks have a very acute angle. They mustn't be too wide. That gives you more wiggle room in your design. I also use a cutter that has a wider angle for certain romantic registers. But for a baroque sound, I use this thin one. Next I have a metal spatula, a dental spatula. Here too the tip is convex. I use it to go behind the edge of the lower lip. I check if there's a ridge there or dirt. If so, I can rub the ridge or the dirt to the side. And then I have another tool with which I can scrape this ridge away. It's got a square end, and I move it like this to remove a ridge if there is one. My next tool is a lip shaper. If I have to depress the lip of a pipe, I can use this tool to close the lip. And I can use the spatula to move it back a tiny amount again. There are different types of knives. I really like this Stanley knife. It's easy to switch blades and they don't cost much anymore. That way you always have a sharp tool. This item here is my felt mat. I always keep it moist with a bit of oil like this. That way I get a slight oily film on the blade, which makes it glide better. Next, I have my three-edged scraper to scrape out the pipe. It also has a rounded construction. But I also use it a lot to get into the corners of a flue when the mouth of the pipe has edges, so I can close the flue a little at the sides. This tool allows me to beat down the languid. The steel weight has a lot of mass. I hard soldered it. If you were to soft solder it, this would come down and wouldn't hold. This didn't stay in place during the hard soldering, so I screwed it in and added a rivet. Another thing that's important is that the foot is chamfered, so I can reach right into the corner and hold it at an angle, so I can beat down the languid right at the sides. Then I have these rods. With this one, you can see it best of all. All my rods are chamfered at the end. I use them to beat the languid from below. This angle is necessary because there's the flue too, and I don't want to knock the nicks in the languid, so they close. We need to keep a bit of a distance from these nicks, hence the chamfer. When I knock the top of the languid, on the other hand, it has to get as close as possible to the edge, not to the middle of the languid. That's why this edge is very sharp. I have a large one, and I have this size. They've all been treated in the same way. You need this tool in all sizes. I've made all these tools myself. The dental spatula is a dentist's tool, but I've made it much thinner. I've polished and shaped it to give me this shape. 
This is made from a piece of machining steel. This is an ebony grip. I've stuck a piece of brass into it with an epoxy resin adhesive. This used to be a triangular file, but I've filed it to make it round. You can only make this yourself anyway. You can't buy these things. Okay, I bought the knife. What else? The toothbrush, that's just a regular toothbrush for cleaning. For stropping, I have this sheep's leather soaked in Unipol and oil. The Unipol contains chalk and the oil prevents the chalk from drying out. I can create the finishing touch of smoothness or sharpness by running the tool over this. I have this narrow bell from Weiblen. It's very important. You need that for feet and for larger pipes that don't have a tuning slot, so you don't impact them too much when you're tuning them. Then I have the knife I use to cut the pipes at the top. Let me get one. It works like this. It's a simple planing knife that we had left over from our planing machine. It has a vidya blade. I wrap leather around it and string with glue to prevent it from fraying. It's great for cutting the pipes down by a fraction of a millimeter at a time, and quickly too. What else do I have? Metal shears? Now these I love. I can't get them anymore. They're smooth on both sides and they're pre-tensed. If I've got a piece of sheet metal in them, they're still straight because of that pretension. That's very important. A foot punch. This one's a bit blunt, but I think it's clear what it's for. Then I have various files for when I have to restore language and make them smooth. I have to get under the languid. Sometimes I have to redo the lower lip. I made this nail file very thin so I can get into the gaps and underneath. I can smooth over ridges and languid nicks. This is my magic file that every organ builder has. It's for working with roughened languids as you would with neo-baroque tuning. It's been treated with a drill, like with a rasp, but the trick is that it doesn't stay too rough or sharp. Instead, you treat it with wire wool to smooth over it. You're left with these pimples. If you want, for example, to copy historic pipes, where the flues have these slight imperfections, you can copy them with this tool. So the lower lip and the languid get minor dinks. But in our case, the flues were free from humps or ridges. They were very precise.